Good afternoon, everybody. The thought that has been bothering me a little bit before this session is how to prime an audience into a work of deep scholarship, which the authors themselves have spent many years understanding, researching, and writing. So I thought that I will contextualize this discussion, this journey into the past, by telling you all about its contemporary relevance, its relevance in politics and in society. One of the most polarizing questions we have had as Indians has been questions related to the Aryan and Dravidian divide. In fact, so contentious was this debate that the entire Dravidian politics was built around it. There was a former chief minister of Tamil Nadu who passed away not too long ago, who used to seriously object to burning of Ravana effigies, what we call as Ravana Podi here in Odessa. He used to say that burning Ravana was an insult to the people of Tamil Nadu because Ravana is a Dravidian king who was attacked by an Aryan king named Ram. So this is the relevance of this debate. Now to be very fair, Dravidian politics was not did not represent the only interest group that profited off this debate. There have been many other actors, but I will not launch into that discussion now. What is more important now, my dear friends here, is to tell you where these two books come in now. These works of scholarship have decided not to fall on either side of the debate. They are, on, on the other hand, they are going to try and diffuse the question. Diffuse, not D-I-F-F-U-S-E, D-E-F-U-S-E. Diffuse, deactivate, and disarm the debate with the principal arguments that we are neither Aryans nor Dravidians, we are both and many more. So I welcome you, uh, Mr. Balakrishnan and Mr. Joseph, to this discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. I think the first thing we should start with is if you, if you could give your understanding of the essence of these two words, Arya and Dravida. What do they mean, really? I think most people don't have an idea about that. Good evening, everybody. I'm glad to be here. I would rather, even starting, before even starting with what is uh, Arya and Dravidia, I will take a clue, which I was not expected that the conversation will start with Ravana. It's better in a way. In a way that has been uttered, then let me take off from there. When I came out of Tamil Nadu, uh, joining Indian Administrative Service, IAS, in 1984, when I went to Masuri, my, our academy where we are trained, uh, some of my friends, educated, IAS passed from UPSC, Casually, they asked me that, uh, do you people worship Ravana? Then, it, it's, I'm telling you, I'm not surprised this question was asked. I also saw some big smile and uh, anticipation. And let me answer this very, very important thing. Recently, also, I have written about it. I didn't, I didn't expect this question. Then I answered that, no, to my knowledge, I never seen anybody in, in South or uh, Tamil Nadu worshipping Ravana. There is no temple for him. No, no, but uh, I am told. I am told. This is, uh, I am told told by an IAS uh, educated a civil servant. Let me come to the truth. After that, life took me here and there. I have, as in the election commission, done 30 state election, just concluded Uttar Pradesh election, UP elections I have done twice. When I was doing, there was 70 districts, now 77 I understand. All the 70 districts I visited, all the districts in Madhya Pradesh, Bihar. In the process, I have traveled all over the North India. For your information, just outside Delhi, uh, just outside Delhi, near Noida, there is a temple where there is uh, two groups are fighting whether to permit Ravana statue to be formally installed, not installed, because Ravana is worshipped there. Second, go to Madhya Pradesh. There is a place called Mandsar. Mandsar is a district, you must be aware thing. People say that it is named after Mandodari. It is the birthplace of Mandodari. The Ravana is his son-in-law of Mandsar. And there is a statue which is 36 feet high for Ravana in Madhya Pradesh. And then this uh, Noida people say that uh, uh, Ravana is basically born that side. 
near in the Mansar uh, thing in Midisa district, there is a village called Ravan Gram. And then in Rajasthan, there is a Brahmin group which they said that if we are the descendant of Ravana and there is a Brahmin and you please Google for the Ravana temples in North India, you will find the truth. If there is a temple for Ravana in India, it is all located in Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. He is a son and son-in-law of Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. But the IAS educated people asked me that, uh, do you worship? Coming to that. Then we don't worship. The, uh, to my knowledge, the southernmost Ravana temple is located in Badrachalam side of Andhra Pradesh, just the uh, other side of the uh, Malkangiri, where this Dandagariyani meets, sir, where this, all the Ramayanam events are put. Then I searched for it. Because of this question, when I was collector Mayurbanj, I started searching for a, uh, one person. Sorry, I have to take this question this way only to make it interesting. Yes, absolutely. I, I was visited by an MLA from uh, uh, Kaptipada. He was the Kaptipada MLA. I was the collector of Mayurbanj. And my PA came and told me that the MLA has come and he sent me a card. His name was Ravano Madai. Then I was uh, attracted. I think that I say his name is Ravan. Then after Katavartakala, after talking to him, I asked him that uh, <laughs> then he said, uh, I said, what's the problem? That we keep uh, Ravana name. No, no, no. I am for the first time coming across. So then I expressed my surprise. Then we talked about he went away. I asked one of my officers, uh, I want to study this. Uh, how many people in our area has got a Ravana thing and all? Then he told me, sir, what is Ravana Madai? In our own office, we have a Kumbhakarna. Then I will bring him to meet you tomorrow. Then my journey started of searching for the Ravana, Indrajit, Meghanath, Mandodari, and Duryodhana, Dushadhana. Then found throughout Orissa and Bihar and other places. There is a Sakuni was a politician in Bihar. And Duryodhan, uh, that's uh, Maji was our minister in uh, thing and all. So then I searched and found throughout India because I was on the election commission. I had an opportunity to search in the voter list. Then I found a person called Ravana, son of Ravana, who was son of Ravana, in Amravati district of Maharashtra. That's a Kutkut tribe. They call themselves as a Ravana Vamsi. He's a tribe. He's not in South India or Tamil Nadu. This is an absolutely concocted and misunderstood propaganda where the people asking, even educated people ask this question. And then, yes. At some point of time in 50s and 60s, Ravana was fronted us for a political conversation, Ramayanam, because to, to put an ideological presentation. And only few people have taken Ravana name in Tamil Nadu because of the Dravidian movement recently. Otherwise, the roots are very deeply. The Ravana, whether he's, there is a, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, in the near Noida and this Mansar, on the day of Ravan Ram Leela, they don't uh, celebrate. They do the mourning. They do the morning in Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh and near thing. And also recently, the Akola district collectors uh, in Maharashtra, in the Gond tribes, they have given a petition to district administration, you should not do the Ravana Podi. So answer, question and answer to this remains in North India and Eastern India. It is, this is, it is a good example how the Indology is conducted in this country. So thank you so much for those brilliant anecdotes. What I distilled from all of them, sir, is that you are talking about the idea of India. And what is this idea of India? That our sense of reverence and irreverence may not be shared by everybody, all the people who inhabit this country. And we have to be respectful towards that. And that is what the leaders of our country who gave us independence meant by unity and diversity. It was not just tolerance towards minorities. It was tolerance amongst ourselves also. So staying on this theme about idea of India, Mr. Joseph, I wonder if I can persuade you to talk to the uh, audience about a very brilliant metaphor that you have used in your book. You have spoken of our sense of shared identity in terms of a pizza. So can you please tell them about the pizza metaphor that is in your book? Thank you. Uh, my book is based on uh, on the 
genetic uh, population genetics findings in that has come out in the recent uh, last 10 years or so that has significantly improved our understanding of population formation across the world south asia not just in south asia across the world uh, and based on that uh, we can say that uh, indian demography is like a pizza uh, you know th this first metaphor came to me quite accidentally when someone in bengal asked me uh, a question about the bengal population who knew i was writing the book and uh, i couldn't think of a better way to explain this and i thought that when i write the book i will definitely find some better way and i have still not been able to find one the pizza analogy is that the base of the pizza is the ancestry of the first indians or the people who uh, arrived in india around 65000 years ago as out of africa migrants the out of africa migrants who came out of the first population group of a few hundreds of Af african people who came out of africa around 70000 years ago then went on to populate all of the rest of the world or the next until the 16000 years ago which is when the last continent the americas were populated so as part of this out of america migrations the the Af the these people reached india now we know around 65000 years ago and the surprising thing is that this is the an largest ancestry that we still have somewhere between 50 to 65% of the ancestry of most population groups in the country would come from the first indians this is surprising information and it has implications which come to later so that's the that's the base of the pizza on the base of the pizza is the sauce what's the sauce the sauce is the the harappans the people who uh, created the agricultural revolution that became the harappan civilization who spread all across the country once a civilization declined starting from roughly 1900 bce and they carried with them their language their culture their practices that had been perfected in the harappan civilization taking it all across the country so in that sense they became ancestors of all population groups in the country so you regard that as the pizza, as the sauce on top of the pizza uh, then one of the major uh, migrations that happened is from the uh, central asian steppe region who brought uh, 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 who pastoralists who brought indo european languages to this uh, country and who are also spread around the uh, around the country Uh, perhaps not like the sauce but there is more of it in some regions and less of it in other regions but uh, you could treat this as the cheese on the pizza and then of course there are many other migrations that contributed uh, to the indian population most of all the austroasiatic uh, migrations that happened from east east asia southeast asia and came into india around 4000 years ago speaking language and, and today they speak languages such as khasi and mundari and uh, that's also one of the major these are the toppings uh, again uh, spread not uniformly across the country but in some parts in central and eastern parts then of course there are lots of other uh, invasions and migrations toppings that came none of which none of which uh, made a substantial impact on our demography but have contributed to our culture in in many ways so so that's the pizza analogy and the implications of this are tremendous Uh, the fact that the base is the first indian ancestry what does that mean it means no matter where in the country you live what language you speak uh, what religion you are where in the caste hierarchy you stand where in the class hierarchy you stand we all carry the ancestry of the first indians right <laughs> that's great so uh, mr balakrishnan you and mr joseph both have tackled these very difficult questions and this deep debate through particular techniques so for example he has deployed a fairly new discipline mr joseph has deployed a fairly new discipline called population genetics you on the other hand have taken a different route i don't want to give it away sir please explain to the audience in very simple terms so they they can understand what technique have you deployed i will i will tell you thing this book i, I don't think i can lift it in one hand <laughs> this is a 3.3 kilo 523 page book which uh, i started working in 1989 88 when i came to orissa and uh, uh, published after my retirement and uh, it's uh, exactly about 2 uh, 2 years 3 months 
is already two reprints have been sold out. We are not even having a two copies only left out. We are going for a reprint. It's a phenomenal. We didn't expect this kind of a response. But I owe this book to the my understanding of India from through Orissa only, through the tribals of Orissa, uh, particularly. And my the whole philosophy, the whole concept which I am trying to say, taking from what uh, um, Tony said that my idea of India, I, India is not a melting pot. Normally we have a unity and diversity. We have a tendency to tell that uh, we are a melting pot. Melting pot doesn't impress me. Melting pot is a place where different metals are put together and melted and a new alloy is made. All the input put into that melting pot loses its identity. It becomes a new metal. It's a new alloy. So that melting pot in a way is a slaughterhouse. This is a place where the identities are lost, lost forever. Something new is created. So then one of the alloy is going to tell this alloy is me, not you. I am something different. So that way, the melting pot is a slaughterhouse. Second thing, you have to go to America. People say that, uh, say, uh, say black Americans, Afro-Americans, Hispanians, Mexicans, white Americans, all put together the multiculturalism. The conversation right now revolves around what is called, yeah, what is called salad bowl. So salad bowl is a new metaphor used. But I don't agree with that for India. Because salad bowl is a post-harvest product. It's a post-harvest process. And uh, there is an entry, entry test done. What will make it to the, to the dining table? I don't put brinjal. I don't put the lady finger. I am going to put the carrot and the radish. I am going to put the very nice looking, uh, stylish vegetable. Everything does not make it to the salad bowl. It is a post-harvest process. It is not organic. There is a selection process. So this country is a multicultural, multilingual country. I use the met metaphor, new metaphor called India is a rainforest, tropical rainforest. Rainforest is one thing where there are multiple layers. Every layer coexists, independently exists, interdependent, there is an interdependence, there is an identity for everything. If you go to rainforest, there is a forest floor, then again another uh, bottom line, another middle line, another canopy, then oversuit. So that way Indian culture, as he pointed out, nobody can climb that uh, this is my product, uh, this is uh, history starts with me, culture starts with me. These are all cockled bull story. India is a rainforest, uh, that is where we start. So the tribals taught me. The, I went to Koraput to work, I, I understood the tribal culture. Today if you want to give a credit to the domestication of rice, you have to go to the Jaipur Valley and uh, talk to the tribes of uh, Orissa. So that is the reason Orissa I respect because of it is a multicultural wonder. If you want to give a pluralism, a living example, in 62 tribe, they belong to three different linguistic family, not three different languages. Austro-Asiatic, Dravidian, and Indo-Aryan group live together in India, in Orissa. In undivided Koraput alone, 52 tribals. I, the greatest tele photograph I have ever taken is that all the tribes came to uh, all the 62 uh, Bhuneshwar, after our Honorable Chief Minister taking a photo, I stayed back. My lifetime aim, that photo I have taken, that photo is the only greatest photo I have ever taken in my life. Because this tribe, this multiculturalism, you cannot iron it out. So the articulation right now, what is happening in India, is the exclusive versus inclusiveness. Pluralism versus exclusive, mono kind of articulation. So this book talks about, articulates about the uh, various kind of, for this, I have developed a various methodology. Indus Valley script, uh, what is written, cannot be deciphered. What is written in Sumeria was deciphered because of something called Rosetta Stone. It's a bilingual script. So you use this uh, dead language, read a dead language through a living language script. In, unfortunately, in Indus Valley civilization, no bilingual script is available. So you have to make a guesswork through the, I uh, deploy something called Understanding the body language of the culture for which I have used the toponymy. That means toponymy means names, that means study of the names. When people migrate, what they carry? They cannot carry their building. They cannot carry their hills. They cannot carry their uh, vehicles. They cannot carry. They carry their memories. They carry their gods. Look at the Jagannath story. How Jagannath Chalchalikasale, where from there 
then uh, so you know that the story how the jagannath from one place to another place these are all metaphors you can see that how the memory travels like this when the people travel they carry their place names europeans took the place name to america afro americans took the africans took the place name to the Af uh, americas and uh, like that parsis took the iranian place name to india like that i used the method and found out some 400 place names celebrated as the unique identity of tamils in the 2300 year old tamil literature which is not known to any other people any other language this place name frozen as a fossil of the past in the indus valley area they carried and put it in their first literature celebrated as their identity even today it's a living tradition in tamil nadu i asked a question what is left out what is brought so topodomy is the only one example i have used something called pottery in the archaeology pottery is in one segment which is totally neglected it's a neglected because a truck and truckloads of uh, pottery will come they will not even store it i used a technique called pot root i have meticulously put all the pot varieties in india painted gray ware pgw black and red ware brw northern block polished ware nbpw all these occurrences I meticulously put on a map and showed that how this particular represent the interaction between two different group of people in the post industry site. And so I use a linguistic method. My study is a basically multidisciplinary. Bit of anthropology, bit of linguistics, place name studies and, uh, and sociology. And put together I have put a various uh, examples to place my argument. My argument is not in favor uh, celebrate somebody at the, at the cost of somebody else. Ultimately, I say that it's a rainforest, don't tell. See, Jagannath Mandir, the, the highest position cannot claim that I am the whole Mandir. There is a foundation. You cannot, you cannot forget a foundation. Eh? You cannot talk the idea of India without talking about the tribal. If you treat your tribal, you, the, all your past as nothing, everything started with me, I only came and civilized, that story can be, could have been told. You know that for your information. Where we start our history? We start our Orissa history only with the Kalingya War. As if before Kalingya War, there was nothing. They, uh, who fought in Ahsoka? So people know only Ahsoka. For your information, till 200 years back, Ahsoka was unknown to Indian people. Ahsoka was found by a prince up. There is a person, two, three people worked very hard and read all the uh, Brahmi thing. They gave a name called Ahsoka and Brahmi. They deciphered the name and they came out with the uh, information about the Ahsoka, otherwise we will not know Ahsoka also. So we had an history without Ahsoka, we had an history without Mohanjodhara and Harappa. Suppose imagine, John, John Marshall did not bring to the, our knowledge about the Harappa and Mohanjodhara, we would have started our entire understanding from the Vedas only, which is not a fact. That's what I, this book is trying to say. Uh, my voice clear. Is my voice clear? For those who have not yet read the journey of a civilization, I think what it does brilliantly is is answer a question that has so far been left unanswered. What happened to the people of Harappa? We know from genetics, we know that they mixed all over, uh, and uh, their ancestry is today in everyone, and that we can also therefore guess that they took their culture and language and practices with them. But the question is, what evidence do we have for that spread and that language after the uh, decline of the Harappan civilization? And by using place names uh, and absolutely, fa to me, the most fascinating parts of journey of civilization has been the, uh, the use it makes of Sangam literature. And the most stunning fact was the Sangam literature has imagery that cannot be uh, related to southern India, like uh, like camels that eat, eating dry bones, and uh, a poetry that that uses the analogy of uh, of a, of a pile of things on the seashore to a camel lying on the seashore. You won't never see a camel lying on the seashore in Tamil in Tamil Nadu or Tamilagam larger. So by using a variety of things, not only in, 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 in Sangam literature, but as well as in the pottery across Eastern India and Central India, uh, and also practices like the wearing the 
buffalo horn uh, dress by the tribals in uh, in orissa for example you can see patterns of behavior that were visible in the had in the indus valley civilization that are now today visible across uh, a lot of southern india and eastern india and which have been crystallized and preserved in the sangam literature because i am sure we have lost a lot of other literature but sangam literature still survives and that has the so i i just wanted to give a uh, no absolutely sir so since you've already mentioned harappa mr balakrishnan would you care to tell us about what insights does the settlement give about what kind of a society harappa was you've used a very beautiful phrase it represents an urban climax what does it mean sir see harappa represent a few thing like uh, anything which india had not seen before before john marshall says harappa it's not that everybody 100% population was living in urban cities but it included great urban cities egyptian civilization is about pyramid pyramid is about kings and their after life the people were buried slaves were buried women were buried sumerian civilization about the temples but indus civilization was about the civic communities there were no temple no pyramid but drainages there was a toilet there was a kind of good buildings drainages big drainage small drainage so it is about a civic life that mean there is a great bath granaries and all number one urban climax number two the dominant imagery when it comes to the, there was there must have been some belief system faith system the dominant imagery is the feminine the worship of the female goddesses whether it, some people call it a mother goddess some people call it a fertility god then some people this is called the dancing girl of mohenjodara with uh, john marshall says that the beautiful thing is ever happened in 4500 year back anywhere in the world this was made this is a, this i am holding this was made in orissa by a tribes i got it made and took it to chennai when my book was released this is was the memento given to tony joseph also was there this was the memento given to the people who attended the program on the dais this is made in orissa the method used in making this dancing girl exact size in mohenjodara is called lax lost wax method that been dokra casting this is uh, practiced in orissa jharkhand and uh, chatisgarh only in eastern india it's a classical form is called in tamil nadu swami malai where you see that a huge nadraja you must have seen that nadraja and uh, all chola bronze this is called chola bronze the method used is exactly lost wax method if the chola bronze of the swami malai and nadraja represent the classical position of the lost wax method this represent the exactly mohanchodara version and the kurud version both are interlinked we cannot talk about recognizing these two spectrum second is mother goddess third thing is that foreign trade that mean it is a maritime trade the harappan people were having a business relationship with the sumeria and mesopotamia they were concentrating in the value added product not a huge volume particularly the ornaments lapis lazuli lapis lazuli and cornelian beads and the barrel beads this kind of very high cost item put in their pocket they took it so i can say urban mother goddess worship and no symptom of huge religious orientation and people were focusing on the day to day life and importance of the past time past time of the past there's a concept lot of toys children playing importance for the physical culture uh, taking bath there is a public bath a small small toys so it is like this about four or five salient features are found in a thing which is not what is not found nowhere in indus civilization harappa mohenjodara the evidence for horse is found there is no horse there is no lion but there is a tiger and there is a the wheel used is the disc wheel not the arc wheel so there are many things which is differentiating and put the uniqueness of harappan mohenjodara culture and you can see that it is not only you can trace it in tamil you can you can trace it in orissa also i have a great feeling sisubalgar a great urban achievement and we have, we have lost a track of it and then it's a great achievement in the uh, kandagiri udayagiri and what karavela climbs and then bringing water 
uh, what is called the Gupta Nala. That water brought from and uh, and he is from Nanda dynasty. He is uh, extending the water supply. And I have travelled in Chaurasi area in the Prachi Valley. In the Chaurasi village, there is a village is there where there is a network of well. Huge achievement. But we don't talk about that. So the urban climax spread all over. But unfortunately, we all believed it started from the Rajagraha and Maurya. But Indus Valley civilization broke all those myths. What is infectious about each of your answers, sir, is your enthusiasm, which we all love. But in the interest of time, maybe we should shorten our answers a little bit so that we can cover far more ground. But sir, your remarks have set one more question in my mind, and I want to bring in Mr. Joseph's book at this point. So your book says that before this urbanization in Harappa happened, there was a wave of early farmers. So some questions come to my mind. Why did we not continue to stay farmers? Why did we have to urbanize in the first place? That is one question. The second is, what kind of authority legitimizes this tectonic social shift? Is it kingship? Is it a single source of authority? Is it a federation of authorities? It is kingship, it is a priestly class, it is a scribal class. So I want both of you gentlemen to tackle this question. But first, Mr. Joseph, please. Um, the, the clearest answer to, we have to how did the cities rise from agricultural villages is from the first city of the world, which is called Uruk in, uh, uh, in Iraq. From the archaeological record that you can see, that initially people were farming by what is called, you know, letting water. Uh, but once they started using new technology, which is irrigation and larger, uh, and you're taking water deep inside the lands in the valleys, all of that required uh, common uh, working. Not only, not until then, you only required individual families to do a little bit of managing of water. But to irrigate large tracts of water, people needed to act together. And when they did that, their productivity rose hugely, which means they're producing far more. And not only irrigation, it went along with many other things. So when productivity increases like that, uh, two things are required, right? Somebody has to be organizing that. Who organized it? In Uruk, we know the answer. And we know that that is not the answer that uh, the Harappans found. Mm. In Uruk, you can see temples rising and we know that that's where the power is that's where that's the, who are organizing it hmm. and as they as as there is far more than what one person can uh, consume or one family can consume there's a lot more which means to use a social science term there is surplus somebody has to be acquiring the surplus who is acquiring the surplus the temple the temple becomes the center the temples become larger, more luxurious, but the, but the houses do not change. So we know how it arose, the driving force being there is greater productivity, so there is possibility for acquiring surplus, which earlier there was not, because if you are hunter-gatherers and you, are, uh, you do not have any surplus to, for anybody to acquire, so societies are more equal. So when you are into agriculture and productivity increases, societies can afford to be can, it's possible for it to be unequal. And that's what happened in Uruk. Uh, we do not know the precise answer to what is the process that uh, Indus Valley uh, civilization, the Harappan civilization followed, because we clearly do not see temple powers. Very clear distinction. Uh, we do not see large irrigation works of the kind in Uruk either. So it is something else that pe brought people together. But what can be sure is that there was productivity increase. And that productivity increases possibly because people move down from more hilly areas of Mehargarh and things like that into the, uh, in, in, into the greater river valleys, which produce greater productivity. So it is greater productivity that you see. Uh, uh, because greater productivity means people can be, do other things other than grow food. Uh, create, uh, cre you know, create houses, create better houses, create large stadiums for people to do things. So that's what led to. But the process that Harappan civil people of the Harappan civilization used, we do not know. We know that it was not the same as in Uruk. So I'll come back to you, Mr. Balakrishnan. All this, does it suggest that perhaps, maybe, this was a less unequal society? And I'll share a little bit of research I, I did for this discussion. Uh, 
One of the most important plays of Tagore happens to be written in 1910 and it's a play called Raja and it talks about an absent king. The people are the king. That's how the play goes. And it is believed that Tagore took inspiration for this play from the Upanishads. So the Upanishads were probably talking about a less unequal society. Is it, a, is it an interesting course of investigation for you? Yeah. I think this, uh, this is a 1910 Tagore, no? Yes. Indus yes. Valley civilization was not found by that time. It uh, took another 14 years for the yeah, Harappan model to come. I'll, I'll yeah, let me tell you. Uh, what I see that the body language of Harappa, I think, it is articulated through two segments of the town planning itself. That means what is called Chitadal, located in the west. The Chitadal, slightly higher elevated place, always located in west. And then there is a lower tavern, located in a slightly lesser altitude, and always located in the east of it. Then by the body language, what located in the west, if you see that the public buildings, that means granary, then the halls, and then big, big governmental bureaucratic type of uh, settlements are in the west side. Eastern side, that uh, factories and the settlement. But the beauty is that the drainage system in both sides. It is not Jupiter's kind of thing. They have got a civic sense. In uh, Harappa, you are not finding a big palace of a king. You are not finding a temple. Most likely in Harappa, I found that some kind of mayor kind of uh, some kind of city-state and uh, man managed by some group of people and articulated through the uh, architecture itself. High West, Low East, one of my article in 2010 article, which is in harappa.com, you find that High West, Low East dichotomy of Indus cities, a Dravidian paradigm. I written about it, but then uh, I consider uh, the not the Vedic or the uh, Upanishad to be highly egalitarian. I found the model comes from the Harappa, where we did not find the evidence for the huge kings or the temples, but then the, both the towns were had the civic community. I consider it was a less equality. Most likely, people were looking in a group. That means the bead workers. Suppose somebody doing the bead worker, like go to uh, Pune now, sorry, in, in Gujarat. All the diamond makers will be in one city. All the Nasik will have a speciality. Pune will have a one speciality. So that specialized people were living together, probably for the volume. Probably occupation-based divisions took place and uh, not birth-based. Birth-based cost system till until uh, the genetically you see that exogamy, exogamy kind of thing. Earlier there were division inequality, but that was based on occupation division and uh, the endogamy uh, and the kind of marriage related uh, strict rule of the caste system probably later uh, coming. Right, sir. So, uh, we have so much time has passed in this interesting discussion I was forced to look at my watch, though I did not want to. Well, anyway, so let me hasten the course of this discussion and ask both of you gentlemen, the techniques that you have deployed to study ancient history, are you in the process settling some questions which remained in history? Or are you adding one more layer of knowledge to our existing knowledge of history? Which is it, sir? Well, in my case, I started on this project because uh, I, there were serious questions that, uh, that, 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 that these had not been answered were seriously annoying for a very long time, uh, which had to do with who were the Harappans, where did they disappear? How did a people who built uh, the largest civilization of its time, which we often don't realize, as big as the Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations put together, both in terms of area and in terms of uh, population, and sustained its, uh, much in its mature form of 700 years. How come we don't know who they are? Why did it take 1,500 years after that for cities to rise up again? 1, 000, nearly 1,500 years. So these were questions that had not been answered and had been given up almost because they were unanswerable, I guess. So I wanted to look at the latest research across multiple fields because pe people do give up looking for answers because if you can't find answers within a reasonable period of time. So I thought maybe I will strike lucky. Let me see across multiple disciplines. Can we at least get a clearer 
uh, answers than we so far have to these questions. That's how it started. Then it expanded and expanded. You can't answer who the Harappans were unless you know who the early farmers were. Unless you can't know who the early farmers were unless you know who the first Indians were. And it expanded completely out of scope. And then it happily so happened. I mean, it luckily so happened that uh, uh, you realize that a lot of the questions regarding population formation was coming from, I mean, across the world, was coming from population genetics. And then you know the rest of the story. So the answer to your question is, it is the desire to answer questions that had been unanswered that led to the whole thing. So, Mr. Balakrishnan, we were just speaking before the session about sometimes how hostile academia can be to knowledge which is produced outside the university. So with this context, I will repeat my question, sir. Are you adding a layer of knowledge to our existing knowledge or are you settling some questions for us? I'm really not sure whether I'm settling any question, but I, I know that I'm exploring, keep exploring. And one thing I'm sure about myself and uh, thing is that I have an absolute open mind all the time. I never made an argument that I have found out something, this is the final answer. I know that what I am writing here may be uh, disproved after 15 years, 20 years will get uh, uh, improved or a kind of, I have an open mind. And then uh, this is my lifestyle also, because basically I am uh, ideologically completely wedded, completely subscribing to the plural foundation of this country. So I stand to that. Then when I came, do you know that uh, people may ask uh, what is the highest post I ever held in Orissa? People may say additional chief secretary, finance, development commissioner, now chief advisor to CM Adal. Do you know that what is the greatest post I ever held and feel proud of it? Culture secretary of Orissa. I went and told that uh, I am not born here. How can I be the cultural secretary? Four years. Again and again people write, sir, sir, you give up any post but you continue in culture. But I am not born here. See, if I had not had the open mind to celebrate this culture, how people will take me as a culture secretary? And I return. So where I got this lesson? Because my literature, which I, of which I am a student, I, I am a student of Tamil literature, BA and MA Tamil literature. I wrote IAS in Tamil. I am the only person from the faculty of Tamil literature to get into civil services so far. And I have written my book in English. My last engagement in Orissa, the day of my retirement, is the... Uriya version of my old research work on Uriya that was published after my retirement. So Excellent, then sir. this I say celebration of pluralism. Then coming to the academics and non-academics, I, I will rather than say I will any day, because I, everybody expected that me to be a professor or a vice chancellor or a head, head of the department. But uh, luckily I did not become. Because my research, my food comes from my hard work. I work day and night. I handle cyclone, I handle everything. I, I work hard for my earnings, but this is my passion. I will not get an HOD post or reader post or vice chancellor post. I have no allegiance to anything except for the truth. So in the process, any day, I would like to be, choose to be an amateur researcher exploring his own truth rather than being a cunning academician. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, I am being very, very frank about it. You are because being I have, I have seen, I have seen that uh, how the academies here, this is like a Gurukul system. That means a professor has made a statement about a one particular topic. Next 50 years, his student, his student, student cannot open his mouth because that will go against his teacher who guided in the PhD. I have no compulsion. I have not taken a PhD. I refuse to register my study for a PhD. I don't take a penny for my talk. I don't take a penny for my writing. This book is given to the library. I get nothing from it except my passion. So since I am pursuing my passion, I'm a freedom loving researcher and I don't owe anything to anybody. This is what drives me. So I am happy what I am. Absolutely, sir. I, I, I have also thought somewhere at the back of my mind that after the post of the CM, maybe the next most important post should be that of the Minister of Culture on, in every state and country. <laughs> Come on, don't. don't um, no, but I'm, anyway, I'm, we'll, we'll I'm enjoying move. being a writer, researcher, uh, every bit of it, about Orissa, about India, about Tamil literature. I enjoy every bit of my existence. I'm a very, very contented person. Thank you very much. <laughs> But sir, we, we cannot close this discussion without uh, addressing one important question. 
that is the ethics of studying civilization so i will read to you a quote by mahatma gandhi and i would like both of you gentlemen to respond to it in your own ways gandhi says in hind swaraj civilization is not an incurable disease but the english are at present afflicted by it i read the sentence 10 times and i think what i understood by it was when studying civilization let us be more keen on the value systems of that time rather than material achievements how would you uh, tackle this this statement by gandhi so what would be your response more than gandhi i will take it as a greater a greater philosophical take on life and uh, what i studied i mean essentially i cannot claim myself to well versed with vedas or upanishad or like that my my exposure through english only but i can always claim a mastery uh, in sangam text what it tells me it is told uh, in uh, in one one couplet in sangam literature 2400 year old it says that all the places are your places all the people are your kith and kin it's not in tamil yadu mure yavarum kelir second statement another poet making whichever direction you travel ethise chelinum and that direction your food is there then it says that world is so wide and there are lot of patterns are there and uh, thiruvalluvar says that uh, it he's become it's very very inclusive that mean he consider uh, uh, hunger hunger as a disease that mean we saw during our corona how people were walking lakhs of people thousands of people walking in the indian highways absolutely unbelievable so whereas there are says that a thiruvalluvar says that if somebody has to beg and eat and fill his stomach let the man man mean or god whatever it is made this world let him go to hell this is what the sangam literature says i consider civilization is all about caring for others respecting others inclusiveness and not you versus me it is us that i call it's a responsibility the accountability is the civilization and the responsibility of the civilization i consider gandhi felt that only because uh, what he meant probably when you say that inclusive whether you go to certain religion in the world say that it is my god there is no other god exist probably if you look at that uh, everybody they follow their own faith i have no problem with that that kind of inclusivism he articulated and uh, that is my take irrespective of what gandhi felt right sir so civilization the pers- the the knowledge of civilization should not be you versus me that is the essence that i have distilled so i will reframe the yeah. same thing for you mr joseph would it be fair to say that the europeans sadly have used civilization study as a martial discourse always to signal their superiority somebody else's inferiority and that legitimizes their invasion of other countries and other people um uh, i think that the uh, i mean i will go back to the uh, uh, gandhi quote. quote and i think what he was trying to say in uh, as i understand as i would understand it is that uh, the feelings of superiority and inferiority are a problem are an affliction and uh, we have seen it in europe uh, in the last century when feelings of superiority of uh, of nationalities and aggressive nationalism we have seen what that led to since then it has spread around the world they may have uh, been one of the most one of the most uh, so far atrocious forms were seen in the last century but i think unfortunately it has spread all around the world and the antidote to this i think is a better understanding of where we come from uh, and that's why the study of history and even prehistory is important i would like to quote may make two quote take two quotes about uh, why study of history is important one is by terry pratchett the british writer who said unless you know where you come from you don't know where you are and unless you know where you are you don't know where you're going so which says the study of history is important for you to look, locate yourself which is a positive way which is also important which says that uh, so you have to have a realistic understanding Uh, 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 for to, to borrow from another discipline uh, you need to know that the earth is not the center of the universe you need to know that the solar system is not the center of the universe you need to know that man is not that different modern man was not all that different from the other homo sapiens we need to know that all of 
uh, life is tightly knit together. We need to know that cultures are linked together. So all of that would have saved Europe then, last century, and many others today from following the same path. That we are interlinked, uh, that we are not as different as politics often makes it out to be, uh, and that we are not one superior to the other. Uh, we, all our families, our families are special to us, of course, it has to be, that's the right way. And uh, to say that your family is superior to all other families is a different matter altogether, and it's not defensible. And that is at the root of aggressive nationalism the world over, and that has to be fought with better understanding of our prehistory, which as, I have, as we have discussed today, leads us to the clear understanding, in, in the case of India, as in the case of others, that we have created a common civilization out of multiple migration histories. Our civilizational impulses, our cultural impulses, our practices draw from all of those, all of those differences. You need to have a respect for those differences uh, to hold this very large country and very large number of people together. So that's it. Right, sir. So what I'm again distilling from these brilliant insights that you have given is that for those who are interested in pursuing knowledge about who they are, the starting point is to acknowledge I am not better than anybody else and knowledge begins from there. So on that note, I would like to invite questions from the audience. I think the audience has now been primed. I, I notice a hand up there already. Can the mic travel to, to these gentlemen? So please identify yourselves by name and ask a crisp question or make a crisp remark. Hello, uh, this is Sujit Mahapatra. Uh, Mr. Joseph, you made a point about Uruk. Yeah. And I would just draw from there. Yeah. You know, generally it has been seen that civilization has been founded on the graveyard of forests. Yeah. Like, for example, in the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh, his first enemy is the forest which he pulls down. Yes. Rome Correct. was founded on forests. Correct. We normally tend to idealize Indian civilization and we talk about it as very environmental. Yeah. At the same time, we had the Khandavan episode, which was one of the first instances of ecocide. Yeah. Uh, so, I would like to ask both of you, because this is a question I've been struggling with. Yeah. So, was Indian civilization... Uh, or what we call Indian civilization, was it very different from the other civilizations which were, as I said, founded on the graveyard of uh, the natural forests and wildlife? Uh, or was it very complicated? To, uh, I think to answer this, question, this particular question about environment, uh, forests and things like that, I, I do not think there is, a, there is any evidence that shows that we would have followed. Uh, there's, there's nothing to base it on. But we have real things to base on many other claims, many other things, such as we do not have the tem tem large uh, temples that the West Asian civilizations had, or even Egyptian civilizations had. We do not have ostentatious statues of kings. Nobody. Even the largest, even the priest king that you have sold, you, it's really, you should go Google and check in what its size is. So we are saying we do not we did not, uh, when you say we, I mean the Harappan civilization, the people of the Harappan civilization, we did not seem to have idealized leaders if they had specific leaders to the point of putting up huge statues of them. Not, and not because they didn't know how to build big things. And uh, there are not tombs of royals who have been uh, buried with huge treasures. Nothing. You most, at most you will find some you know, some food that has been kept for their onward journey wherever. But uh, not because they did not know how to build the treasures, because the treasures that you would find in the West Asian civilizations, many of them came from, uh, from the craftsmen of the Harappan civilization. Uh, we know that there are no large temples. We know that in all the seals that you have found, you will not find a single seal uh, that had human-on-human uh, -human violence. You would see man against animal violence. You, against, you will see man against superhuman uh, beings and violence. So you will see all kinds of violence, but you will not see man against man violence. 
And uh, this is not to say, as many people say, that uh, the Harappan civilization was free of violence. I don't think so. That's not human. They, were, they would have ceased to be human for there not to be violence. But I would s still say, based on evidence, that they don't seem to have glamorized violence, which is very different from what you see elsewhere. And uh, stunningly, a lot of their effort seems to have gone into, as uh, Mr. Balakrishnan also said, into public services. You know, uh, large tanks and uh, uh, and facilities for baths and things like that. So there are a lot of and amazing levels of water preservation. Yes, ecology to the extent that you're talking about water preservation, amazing. The best technology of the world of the time. And they managed to build a settlement in, uh, Tho in Tho uh, Tholavira, which is a water scarce area, because they knew how to manage water better. Right. So these are all very significant. And of course, the la most important thing at of all, we still don't know how they managed it all. Because there doesn't seem to have been a king. They might have been different cities managed by different uh, groups of people. And if that is so, how did they ma manage such uniformity? The, op the uniformity, sorry, uniformity of the kind, uh, uniformity is not the word. Many of the standardization of weights and measures and things like that, which you don't see in the in Mesopotamia. How did they manage that? These are mysteries. So obviously, we, the common assumptions that we have about the kind of societies we need to have to create large civilizations is probably faulty because we do not yet have understood that there is another way of building a civilization uh, without following the West Asian or even the Egyptian model. So what it is, we have to find out maybe if you read Sangam literature more, we will. Who knows? Right. So we have time for one more question. And I would like to give preference to the person who wants to ask Mr. Balakrishnan a question. Yes, sir. The gentleman in the yellow shirt. Good evening, sir. My question to Balakrishnan, sir. I'm Setupati, a bus pensioner from banking sector. Sir, recently I read in one of the monthlies, Telugu monthlies, about your book. In that, I came to know that you found out a village in Orissa where Tamil origins have been found. Can you please name the village and which district? Thank you very much. Not exactly the Tamil origin, you can say. First, uh, India, I'll tell you, there are 17 villages in Tamil Nadu say, called Kalingapatti. Okay. Uh, let me start from there in the reverse side. So Kalinga means in Orissa, in, in Tamil Nadu, it's in ancient time itself known as Orissa. <coughs> what is now modern day Odisha. In ancient Tamil language also, the word Kalingam means the dress material, fabric. Fabric is called Kalingam, Udai and Kalingam. These are the two terms used in Sangam text 2000 years back. And then even today in Surat, maximum weavers are from Ganjam. And this particular weaver settlement is called Kalingapati in Tamil Nadu. Kalingam was known as a dress and all this. So that uh, there is a huge amount of uh, people. But uh, the, at the same time, uh, where my research started, uh, I, I, I never know that it has uh, been published in a Telugu uh, in a doll. When I was working in Koraput, I was traveling in my jeep. And suddenly something I saw, a milestone uh, in Oriya and uh, English. I read it Tamili, T-A-M-I-L-I. -I. I, for a moment, I thought that uh, did I see it properly. Then I asked my driver to slightly come back. I got down and read it. So Oriya Rilakaitala, Tamili, and then T-A-M-L-I. So then it could be just a what funny thing, it could be something accident and all. So, but I know that area very well because this is an area where the Dravidian tribals are living. Within Orissa, for example, that Kui, the Kandamal Kui, Kubi, Dongriya Kond, and uh, Malkangri Koya, and uh, Duruvas, and uh, Olari Galavas in Salur side, and uh, then this side in Sundargad, uh, Oran, uh, Oran people, all these people are the Dravidian language speaking people. The Oran Lokongro, that's a, their name, uh, language is Kuruk. And the Kui people language is Kui. And then uh, Kubi Kando people name uh, language is Kubi. So I know that I was standing in an area where the Kandos who speak Kubi language are located. Then I decided to go to that village. It's a half kilometer inside. And then I was telling myself, if I go and find a tribal village which speaks a Dravidian language, I am into some serious studies. If that is not a fact, I will just uh, go back and continue my travel. And I didn't know where, whom I am going to meet. 
I went there, found Kubi speaking tribals, and I started uh, conversing with the help of my driver. I found so much of similarity, language, word for eyes, word for skin, word for hand, word for uh, lady, all these things are the, basically Dravidian languages are all over. You see the north, northwest, uh, in the Pakistan, there is a language called Pragui. And this side, Sundargad is uh, Kuruk, uh, Oran. And in Jharkhand side, uh, there is a language called uh, Mal Pagadia. All are Dravidian languages. So since I found a Dravidian people living, Whatever the meaning of Tamil, I decided to start a serious study. My Indology journey started from that village, then ultimately resulted in this book. So, and then there is also, that, that's how it started. Right, sir. This discussion could have gone on and on. I think many of you, most of you and all of you will agree with that. One question? Okay, please go ahead. Huge regards, sir. Um, actually, I would like to ask Dr. Balakrishnan uh, uh, that earlier he mentioned about that caste system was just the division of laborers. Whereas uh, Dr. Ambedkar in his book Annihilation of Caste mentioned that ca caste system is not just the division of laborers, but not just the division of labor, but the division of laborers. And um, also, uh, Joseph, sir, uh, I, I wanted to ask that, is the book somehow inspired by Dr. Ambedkar because he also outrightly rejected the Aryan invasion theory? So, uh, kindly highlight in us. I will take this question. See, the thing is, the, whether it is a function of the uh, division of labor or by marriage and birth, there is a two way of looking at things. If the genetic studies are now showing, we, we did some study with the Professor Pichapan, he's a close friend of mine. I have collaborated in many of the articles also, they put my name also in the DNA related study last 15 years. We have taken sample from here and there. I, I used to also suggest that based on place name and occupational group, we used to take the sample. Now it clearly proves that what we take as our surname and great cost and all, it carries no meaning. Absolutely, if you get nearer to the uh, DNA, then the, the I, I, I just written recently a poetry in Tamil that grandmother knows the grandfather's name. Forget it. So it's very simple. The flood, blood flows across the, across this continent. Nobody can say, I am a great guy, I am a superior race, I am a superior caste and all. It's all cock and bull story. The DNA does not support that. It's a beginning and end of it. But then it become the caste system become perpetuated and birth based when the marriages were controlled. Mar when the marriages were controlled, because we had a, we had a, this society which is Sangam literature puts before me, the kind of society, the ancient society is an absolutely people falling in love and getting married. And it's a, it's a, when it comes to the marriage, Indian society was not what it is today. It's not the matrimonial ad. If you are looking for the fair looking Amako Kotra, and Amako Kamurai Koriva, this kind of uh, thing was not happening. This is all happened during the Gupta period and other later period perpetuated. And then Gotra based, caste based, and exogamous and endogamous marriages were controlled. Only when the marriages were controlled, the caste system become very, very thin. And more importantly, you keep it, anybody claim superiority based on the Varna system. It is absolutely unscientific, let me tell you. Because that if you look at the great authors, you go near to that. If you are a great author, then either you happen to be somebody else, then his parenthood, something like that, something, some story is told about Valmiki, some story about Vyasa. The great scholars say, they come from everywhere, every corner, every segment. Then you build a story around him. You build a story so that you justify why he is knowledgeable because uh, there is parenthood or something like that. So these are all uh, basically built up stories and more and more science is throwing uh, light on it. And of course, I am worried whether we are actually making a good progress towards uh, basically removing God. So long as, let me tell you, forget about civilization concept. So long as untouchability is there. So long as a fellow human being removing the, the fecal material of another human being. So long as a human being getting into the sewage and dying because of the toxic gas and in spite of the technology available, we can never claim ourselves as a developed society. There is no doubt about that. Right. So I'm sure many of you have other questions. 
uh, you may perhaps approach the authors af after we get off the stage. Our patient organizers have indicated to me that we must bring this session to a close. And I will quickly do so with a personal anecdote to pitch why you must read these books. My name is Sampat Patnaik, but I am half a Malayali. I grew up in a joint family, and when I was very naughty, some close relatives used to tell me that you're behaving like a Dravida. So see the bias. So these debates are not happening in obscure places. They are happening in your family. I was 10 years old at the time and I did not have an answer, but today I do because I have read Journey of a Civilization Indus to Waigai, because I have read Early Indians by Mr. Joseph. So I would encourage all of you to do that as well. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your brilliant insights and thank you, audience. Hello. Yeah, uh, this book is now out of print. It's, uh, it's already second thing is over. Then we are going for a reprint the third edition. And we re recently brought out uh, in our uh, research library. I am the honorary consultant of the Indus Research Center, established by Airavada Mahadevan from 2011. Uh, it is located in Chennai. Um, we are a uh, very full-time committed guys in this field. So we recently brought out a calendar, the journey of a civilization, uh, 12 months. I would like to uh, give present this to the Ms. Patnaik. Thank you so much, sir. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, okay. Malavika is on there. She is there. Okay, give it to her. Thank you very much. Our next session for today is titled Her Story, Her Words. Yashodhara Mishraji and Sanghamitra Mishraji on the writings on women writing as women. They'll be in conversation with Hiranmai Mishraji. I'd request all of them to come on stage, please, and I'll give brief introductions. <laughs> 